Exodus 30, right in the midst of the tabernacle of the congregation, the describing of it and the construction of it. This thou shalt give every one that passeth along them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 garas, a half shekel shall be an offering unto the Lord. So, oh, them raw bezel there, all right. Here we go, here we go, here we go. So, remembering that this Hebrew word, H6944, for sanctuary, is the same Hebrew word that we're getting for holy. We're getting for holy, and where it, it, it's describing the veil between the holy place and the most holy. I didn't notice this. So, most holy. So, it's translated out. Two different English words here, isn't it? Most holy. H six nine double four. It's describing it's describing this veil which Hebrews is telling us. Well I'm being led to think Hebrews is telling us that this veil is the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And when we see it as sanctuary we're getting at as, look at this in Exodus 36, 1, right? Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiab, every wise-hearted man, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. According to all that, the Lord had commanded service of the sanctuary, and it's the same Hebrew word as holy place and the most holy. Right, this word sanctuary eight six nine double four, and we see it right through Exodus, and then we see it in Leviticus four six, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord before the veil of the sanctuary. Look at this, before the veil of the sanctuary of the most holy, the holy, the sanctuary. Right. But as I say, we're getting two different Hebrew words whenever we see the English word sanctuary in the Old Testament. That's the one I've just been dealing with there that goes to holy, most holy. That's talking about the veil that, that separates the holy place from the most holy. And we're, we're also reading about Bezalel. He's, he's rotting the, the, the sanctuary, right? That's that Hebrew word there. But we've got this second one. We've got this second one, H4720. Now, the first time we actually see it translated out as the word sanctuary, we're seeing it in Exodus 15, and this is the song. This is the song they sung after the Lord led them out of the land of Egypt through the Red Sea. And we first see this word sanctuary, and then in Exodus 25, and let them make me a sanctuary that was to be made after the pattern of the tabernacle that was shown to Moses in the mount. And then that sanctuary in Exodus 26 is being referred to as, as the tabernacle. 
Now, in Exodus 15, this is most, most interesting indeed. They shall bring them in and plant them, right? Plant them. People as plants. I think about that scripture in Mark, where the Lord Jesus Christ was healing a man of his blindness, and he said, I see trees as men walking. And then the Lord Jesus Christ healed him again, and then he saw properly. And plant them. And right through the scriptures, we're seeing manifestations of people being referred to as trees and, and seed as people. And plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. So what's this mountain, right? What's this mountain of the Lord God's inheritance? In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. Right? In the sanctuary. O Lord, which thy hands have established. So he stretches out the heavens as a curtain for a tent for them to dwell in, right? So this to me is reading that thou shalt bring the children of Israel in and plant them in the mountain of the Lord's inheritance. In the place, O Lord, so the, 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 the children of Israel are going to be planted in the mountain of of the Lord's inheritance. And that place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. Right, so thy hands have established. So is this now the sanctuary that the Lord Jesus Christ is a, is a minister of the true tabernacle because this is talking about the sanctuary which the Lord's hands have established. This is reading to me that the Lord has made for the Lord to dwell in, in the sanctuary that the Lord Lord's hands has, has established. But it's also pertaining to the place, the mountain, where the children of Israel are going to be planted. So this, this piece of scripture is led me to think that we've got the children of Israel being planted in the mountain of the Lord's inheritance, and that mountain is the sanctuary that the Lord is going to dwell in. So the children of Israel are going to dwell in, in the sanctuary, which is the mountain of the Lord's inheritance, and that's the sanctuary that the Lord's hands has established, and that is leading me to think could well be could well be the true tabernacle, right? Because the Lord's hands the Lord's hands have established it, right? So then we come down into Exodus 25 and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So it's fascinating stuff because we've got, I'm being led to think that Exodus 15 is talking about the children of Israel dwelling in the sanctuary that the Lord's hands have established. But Exodus 25 a is pertaining to the Lord having a sanctuary being made by man so that he may dwell among them. So they're dwelling amid his sanctuary, but he's dwelling in the sanctuary that they have made for him, and that sanctuary is to be made after the pattern of his sanctuary that they are dwelling therein. Psalm 15, 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Right, so is this the tabernacle that was built, that was pitched by man? Or is this the tabernacle that was shown to Moses and Moses was commanded to make the tabernacle that was made by man after the pattern of, 
of the true tabernacle. Which one's this? It seems to me now we've got two tabernacles going on. That's what we're getting in Hebrews. We're getting a we're getting the, the, the tabernacle that was pitched by man, and we're getting the tabernacle that was pitched by the Lord. And one was shown to Moses, and he was commanded to make the one that was pitched by man after the pattern of the the one that was pitched by the Lord. Are we looking at a heavenly tabernacle? I'm just a fever pitch. That's what we're actually looking at. But check this out, right? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So what's this holy hill? What's this holy hill? And is this connected to Exodus 15? Thou shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. So the Lord has um, a, an inheritance that's a mountain, right? And it's pertaining to his sanctuary. This, this, the, the, Exodus fifteen seventeen, is absolutely saying to me that the Lord's sanctuary is the mountain of his inheritance, and that sanctuary, the Lord's hands has established himself. And in Psalms fifteen. We're getting the Lord's tabernacle who shall dwell in thy holy hill. So it's a it's an end of a sentence. It's a question. Hasn't got a capital letter. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So are we talking about the same thing? Is the Lord's tabernacle his holy hill are we looking at the same thing here because in exodus 15 we're getting the mountain of the lord's inheritance i'm being led to think he's his sanctuary and in psalms 15 we're getting the lord's holy hill being his tabernacle do we have a connection there? psalm 74 1 and 2 oh god why hast thou Cast us off forever. Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? That just reminds me straight away of John 10. The Lord Jesus Christ is the door and in and out and the porters. But get this. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. So this is leading me to think, pretty much saying that Mount Zion is both the rod of the Lord's inheritance and what he has purchased of old. And thirdly, it's his congregation and it's the sheep of his pasture. So, what is that? Four or five things. We've got Mount Zion is the place where the Lord has dwelt. So that doesn't necessarily mean he's there all the time. It just means that he has dwelt there in times past. But it may actually mean that it's his permanent dwelling place. But Mount Zion is the rod of his inheritance he has redeemed that. He has purchased them of old, them being his congregation, that congregation being the sheep of his pasture. So is this now giving a connection to Mount Zion? Because it's saying that the Lord has dwelt there. Is this now saying that Mount Zion is the mountain of his inheritance? Because in Exodus 15... We're reading about the mountain of the Lord's inheritance is his sanctuary, the sanctuary that his hands has established. So what's this mountain of his inheritance? Is it the rod of his inheritance that he's purchased of old? Is it? Is it Mount Zion? And is Mount Zion his holy hill? And is his holy hill Mount Zion? His tabernacle. And in Exodus 15, if we pick up verse 16, we're reading, this is leading me to think we're talking about the children of Israel because 
The whole chapter's about what happened in Exodus 14 when they passed over the Red Sea. So this is about the children of Israel. I'm pretty much settled on that. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people passed over which thou hast purchased. So the people is the purchase of the Lord. And we come back into Psalm 74, and that's what we're getting. We're getting the sheep of his pasture is his congregation who he has purchased of old. And those people are the rod of his inheritance. And in Exodus 15, we're getting the children of Israel is whom he has purchased his congregation, but he is going to bring them in and plant them in the mountain of his inheritance. And Psalm 74 is telling us that the, it, it goes further for me, it goes further because this has led me to think that the sheep of the Lord's pasture is his congregation which he has purchased. And it keeps going. His purchase also is the rod of his inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. So the Lord has dwelt in Mount Zion, but he has also redeemed Mount Zion, and Mount Zion and his redeemed are the rod of his inheritance, those who he had purchased of old, them being his congregation, them being the sheep of his pasture. And Exodus 15, it separates it because we're getting his purchased are the children of Israel and he's going to plant them in the mountain of his inheritance. And that place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands has established. So Exodus 15 for me is telling us it's very consistent with Psalm 74 in that the, the, the sheep of his pasture, his congregation, is them who he has purchased. They are the rod of his inheritance. But in Exodus 15, we're reading the mountain. We're not reading the rod. We're reading the mountain of his inheritance is his sanctuary. Whereas in Psalm 74, we're reading the rod of his inheritance is everything, including Mount Zion. So now, is, is the mountain of his inheritance Mount Zion? Well, for me, I'm pretty much at fever pitch that that's what we're talking about, that the mountain of the Lord's inheritance is Mount Zion, and so are the people. So of all of his people, they're all, they're all his inheritance. All of this is the Lord's inheritance. And both scriptures are just talking to each other. So all, everything in Psalm 74 is the Lord's purchase, his inheritance, and it's all of these things. And in Exodus 15, I'm being led to think we're getting the same thing. His people, the children of Israel, is his inheritance as is his mountain, the mountain of his inheritance. And that mountain is Mount Zion. Psalm 76 in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion. So, so, okay. So this is this is most incredible indeed. This scripture because this word this word Salem for a star, but Salem Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion. So this now potentially goes away to answer this question: This Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt, and Psalm seventy six is saying that his dwelling place is in Zion, is in Zion. So does that mean, is, is this what was, where I'm going here is, is this what was shown to Moses in the mount? Because this, would this be, would this be the, the, the tabernacle that the Lord pitched or, or, or man, or man? Because his dwelling place is, is in Zion. This, this Zion now, I'm just at fever pitch now, that this Mount Zion is the rod of his inheritance, 
It's he's it, it, all of this is Mount Zion, all of it is Mount Zion, and that's what we're reading here. The Mount of his inheritance is his sanctuary, and that is Mount Zion. That's Mount Zion. So now it becomes absolutely critical. Uh, just exactly what this Zion is. So in Psalm 76, we're getting in Salem is also his tabernacle. So tabernacle is a place where you dwell and his dwelling place in Zion. It's like it's... It's like it's two different places, but it could be the same place that's named twice. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. So the Hebrew word for tabernacle is different again, H5520, and it's translated out as den, pavilion, tabernacle, covert. We only see it four times in the scriptures. Thicket, lair, covert, booth. A hut, as of entwined boughs, also a lair, covert, den, pavilion, tabernacle. And the Chaldee lexicon, it's giving us a thicket of trees, the lair of wild beasts, a hut, booth, cottage, used of a tent or a house, a thicket of trees, the lair of wild beasts, thicket, lair, covert, booth. And we see the scriptures, like to me it's, like a den, that's where lions are. It seems to be where where animals dwell. He he lieth in in wait secretly as a lion in his den. There we go. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him to his net. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. Shall it's so complicated this word tabernacle, eh? It's so complicated. Shall he hide me? He shall set me up upon a rock. I just wonder whether that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the scripture we're talking about here in Psalm 76. And in Jeremiah, he hath forsaken his covert as the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. So that's what we're looking at here in Psalm 76. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. Now I do start to wonder as I put this down whether this is actually pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ as well because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah and we're talking about this Hebrew word being about a lion's den. We're seeing scripture there that connects this word tabernacle with lion's den. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. Now Psalm 110, from what I can gather, we read this twice in the in the New Testament. In, in, in Matthew 22, the Lord Jesus Christ, he talks about this himself. And when I read now Matthew 22... I'm being led to think that this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ because he challenges them. How can I be possibly be David when this scripture comes to pass? So I'm being led to think that this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ directly. And we also read it in Hebrews 1 when the author of Hebrews asks about which of the angels does this scripture pertain to as well so i'm being led to think that this is talking about the lord jesus christ directly the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool the lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of zion rule thou in the midst of thine enemies and here we get this reminds me of hebrews 7 just looking at this as well thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So to me, it's pretty open and shut that those four verses of scripture is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So 
by extension, I see absolutely no reason to be led to think why verse 2 isn't talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord is going to send the rod of his strength, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of Zion, right? Out of Zion. So this is where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be sent forth from. He's going to come straight out of Zion, right? So I now come back to Psalm 76, and I really do ponder. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. So God is, this would be the Lord, he is, his dwelling place is in Zion and he's going to send forth the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, out of Zion. I do wonder, I sit here right now and I do ponder whether that might well be what we're looking at here. But returning to this word tabernacle, something very interesting happens here indeed. Because sometimes it offers us a different Hebrew word. So the, the Hebrew word is C-O-K, and that's the Hebrew character there. And it's offering, it's offering us H5526, which seems to be S-O-K-E. And it's, I don't know, is it the same Hebrew word perhaps? Is it the same Hebrew word? Let's have a look. So we have a look at the characters there. And no, it's, it's different. It's a different Hebrew word, but we go from H5520 to H5526. Now, check this out. And, I don't know, make sure you're sitting down for this one. Make sure you're sitting down for this one. Check this one out, right? So, Hebrew word, H5526, cover, right? You, 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 you understanding where I'm going here? Covering, defense. Now, this is for this word. The, the Strong's definition is giving us H5526 as a result of in Salem. Also is his tabernacle, right? So that's how we got here. Covering, defense, defendest, hedge in, join together, set, shut up. To hedge right, fence about, shut in. I, we're back here again, right? We're back here again. And where does it lead us? <laughs> we're back here again, right? We are back here again to the tabernacle of the congregation. And what's the first scripture? What's the first scripture we get? The cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat. We're back here again. I can hardly believe it. I can hardly believe it. And we're getting, it's very similar, especially bowels to make a hedge, to construct a booth. It's that we're getting similar words to covert booth, and it's talking about a lion's den, the lion of Judah, and it offers us this Hebrew word, which leads us straight back to this tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony. And surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber, right? And this this goes straight into the celestial. This goes straight into the celestial. Celestial Ehud, Ehud, in the in the summer parlour and. I can hardly believe it. I can I can hardly believe it. But but in any case, we we will carry on. So that's the Hebrew word for tabernacle. For Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. Now the word dwelling place is Hebrew word H four five eight five, and we see that only the nine times. We get down again, don't we? Place, dwelling place, refuge, habitation. Dwelling, habitation, refuge, den, lair of animals, right? We get the same thing again. Dwelling place of God figuratively. Of the preceding habitation of Jehovah. Look at this, we get a temple. Of wild beasts, a cave, an asylum, a refuge. The eternal God is thy refuge. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Then they cover 
there in their dens and abide in the covert to lay in wait. And Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Come with me from Lebanon. So this is a whoredom Jerusalem playing the whoredom wife with Lucifer. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Or who shall enter into our habitations, right? So we're talking about animals. Both, both Hebrew words are pertaining to the habitation, the dwelling place of animals. The dwelling place of of animals. So, when we come back to Psalm seventy six, it's difficult. It's difficult to find rest about what we're actually talking about here. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion, and this is taking us back to the covering, to the covering of the tabernacle of the congregation the cherubims covering covering the tabernacle of the congregation but in any case this word this word salem h double zero four shalem and we only see it we only see it three times it means peace right the place of which melchizedek was king most jewish commentators affirm that it is the same as jerusalem and Jerusalem means peace, and so does Solomon. The same as H003, which is Shalem. I know some people use that word when they say hello to each other, when they're trying to talk Hebrew. I've heard this word before. And we see that 27 times. Perfect, whole, full, just, peaceable, miscellaneous. This goes to the, potentially this goes to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that I was talking about a few videos ago. He's not yet full, peaceable, perfect. Yeah, it's an end, it's an end game. It's, it's the perfect written end work. It's a combination of those, of those two things. And that's what we get here. We're getting that for, for this word, peace, shalom, the place where Melchizedek was, was king. As I say, we only see it the three times. And in the Chaldee lexicon, we get, we get of an army here, we get of an army, and we get complete finished, cherishing peace and friendship. So it's going to it's going to a complete work. Peace, perfection, a complete a complete work. And yeah, the first time we see it, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. And Jacob came to Shalem our city of Shusim. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. So this is potentially very exciting indeed because we look under the scripture under, we see in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. So I'm now pretty much at fever pitch that the Lord's dwelling place is, is Zion and it's potentially his holy hill and all these scriptures. I'm going to get back to those scriptures in Psalms and Exodus in just a sec. So if we're looking at here that Salem is also in Zion, that's what we're seeing here, that Salem is actually is actually a city of Shechem. I'll show you some right. I just felt it in my spirit. First time I read these scriptures that there was something about Shechem. It, it was one of the first Hebrew words that I ever checked, you know. It was one of the first Hebrew words I ever checked. And it means back or shoulder. And when I first time I read the scriptures and I start first started looking at, at Hebrew words, I was thinking maybe all of these places make up the body of God because it meant back or shoulder, right? Now, this city of Shechem, he's also a standalone entity. Shechem was the son of Hamor, the Hivite, and he was a prince of the country, right? And he saw 
Dina, Jacob's daughter, and he lay with her, and he defiled her, right? So just before I have a look at that word shesem, which I absolutely want to have a look at, because it's potentially very, very exciting this, because it may actually mean that Salem, where the Lord's tabernacle is, and potentially even Zion, could well be in Shesem. In, in Shesem. And that would, because Shesem's in the scriptures quite a lot. So in Exodus, in Exodus 15, I'm being led to think that the people that the Lord has purchased are the children of Israel, and he is going to plant them in the mountain of his inheritance, and that is his sanctuary, and that sanctuary is the sanctuary that his hands has established. So that's now leading me to ask the question, is this the sanctuary that Moses was actually shown on the mount to make the tabernacle that he made with hands? Is that what we're looking at here? Is that where the Lord is going to put his inheritance of whom he has purchased? Now, Psalm 74 is telling me that Zion is all of these things. Mount Zion is the rod of his inheritance. They are them who he has redeemed. They are them of whom he has purchased of old. They are his congregation and they are the sheep of his pasture. Again, this is absolutely leading me to think that all of this are the children of Israel. So by extension, that leads me to think that everything we're reading about here pertains to the children of Israel as well. It's like the Lord and the children of Israel are one. The way I'm starting to see this now that they are one. And that culminates in Mount Zion. So what I'm seeing is that Mount Zion is the Lord's sanctuary. Not only is his sanctuary there, that's what it is. His sanctuary is actually Zion. And what I'm seeing here as well is that the children of Israel are also, are also Zion. Zion is the mountain of the Lord's inheritance. It's also the rod of his inheritance. And another look at Psalm 76. I've had another bit of a look at this. Could this be saying, in Salem also is his tabernacle, and that tabernacle is his dwelling place in Zion? So Salem goes to peace. It goes to peace and the covering of Melchizedek is the priest of the Most High God and the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this word tabernacle, it goes to covering. So Salem, Melchizedek, the Lord Jesus Christ is his covering and that covering, that tabernacle, is in Zion. That's his dwelling place. His dwelling place is the covering of his tabernacle, which is in Salem. As I say, it's difficult to find rest on Psalm 76, but I've had a bit of another look at it, and I just, maybe, maybe that's what, what, what it's saying. But, so the Lord God, the Lord God's, the rod of his inheritance, which he has redeemed, is Mount Zion. And his inheritance also is the children of Israel and the mountain is also his inheritance, his sanctuary, which seems to be here, seems to be Mount Zion. So they're all, everything's pointing to Mount Zion. But in Psalms 110, we're getting the Lord shall send the rod, the Lord Jesus Christ of his strength out of Zion. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the rod of the Lord's God's strength and he's going to come out of Zion. So the rod of his inheritance is Mount Zion 
and the rod of that inheritance, Mount Zion, the strength of that rod is the Lord Jesus Christ. The strength, the rod of his strength is the Lord Jesus Christ and that is going to, well, he is going to come out of Zion. And it's just fascinating in Psalms 110 now how we're getting Melchizedek again. Melchizedek, there he is, right? There he is. So as I say, we look at Psalm 76, and this now is leading me to think that Melchizedek, the priesthood, the Lord Jesus Christ, that priesthood, the ever the everlasting priesthood, that's his covering. That's his covering. That's his tabernacle. And that tabernacle, which is covered by the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, the you just you just start to wonder now about just the sinning Levites and just exactly what they've done and how it may actually tie in, how it may actually tie into Ezekiel twenty eight, and that that tabernacle, that covering, is his dwelling place in Zion. That's what Psalm seventy six now is leading me to think. That's what that actually might mean. But in Psalm one hundred and ten, we're getting send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Now that word rod is where things start to become, once again, just that little bit more interesting. H4294. Now we see it translated out 251 times, but 182 of those times, we see it translated out as tribe. Rod, staff, staves, tribe. Now, this is the Hebrew word I'm talking about. In Psalm 110, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The rod. So the rod of the Lord's strength is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is going to come out of Zion. And this is what we're getting here. Tribe, rod, staff, staves, tribe. But we have a look at the other time in Psalms where it comes up. This is very interesting given what I'm about to share. Psalm 105, 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. Right? So this is the same Hebrew word as what we're getting for the rod. For the rod of the Lord's strength, the Lord Jesus Christ will come out of Zion. So as I say, we see it 182 times as tribe. Now, the first time we see this Hebrew word translated out as tribe, check this out. We get it, we're straight back into the tabernacle of the congregation once again, and we're talking about Bezalel. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And we see it quite a lot in the later books, later books of Exodus. But the word tribe in the Old Testament, when we see it translated out to the English word tribe, we've got three different we've got three different Hebrew words here. We've got the one I'm talking about, H4294, and we've got this second one, H7625. Now H7625, we only see it the once in Ezra. Now I see this quite a lot in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. I see it also in Chronicles where there's a different Hebrew word only for that book but it's it always seems to be well a lot of the times I see it it's pertaining to the to the same Hebrew word as when we otherwise see the English translation of the word, our understanding of the word. So in Ezra 6 it's talking about the tribes it's pertaining to the tribes of israel but in any case we only see it the once we only see this second hebrew word the once h7625 and then we get this third one h7626 and h7626 that's where we first see the word tribe we see it in in genesis 49 where where jacob's giving the the prophecy and the and the blessing to the to his twelve sons in Genesis forty nine, but we first see it as Skeeter shall not depart from Judah, right? <laughs> shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet till Shiloh. Look at that! I'd never noticed that before. Look at that! 
That's where the tabernacle of the congregation and the Ark of the Covenant was. That's, that's where it was right through the book of Judges. And it was the first place where the tabernacle of the congregation was set up after the children of Israel passed over the river Jordan to go across to the other side to be purified. And we read that in Joshua 18. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And the land had rest. Right? So the tabernacle of the congregation after or during the dividing of all the land to the children of Israel, their inheritance, the land is at rest and the land was subdued before them. And this is the first place where the tabernacle of the congregation was set up after the children of Israel passed over the river Jordan. It was here at Shiloh. And the word Shiloh, it means a place of rest. So we see in Joshua 18, and the land was subdued before them. And there's other, there's other scripture in Joshua around this time that says that the land had rest as well. The land rested from war. There was no war. The land was at rest. And the tabernacle of the congregation was set up at Shiloh, which means a place of rest. Now, again, the word Shiloh, it has three different Hebrew words. We've got two for the word Shiloh, and we've got this third one, H. 8387 Tanath Shiloh. Now Tanath Shiloh it pertains to approaching to Shiloh and we only see it once in the scriptures and it's about it's about the border. It's about the border of 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 Ephraim. But we see with the three with the three Hebrew words for Shiloh, it's pretty much the same letter. We get for seven double eight seven for 7886, we get this character here. For 7887, we get it there. And for 8387, we get it there. It won't let me click on it. It's this one here at the front, that one there. It's it's the same, it's the same Hebrew letter. All three times. So with the with the two times we actually see it translated out as Shiloh, we get it as H7887 and H7886, so they're right next to each other, and it's exactly the same Hebrew character. Now, the time that we see it in Genesis 49 that I'm talking about here, it's this Hebrew word, and we only see it the once. We only see it the once translated out to this Hebrew word, H7886, but it's pertaining to the same thing. It's absolutely pertaining to the same word because it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same Hebrew character. And we see also in both words, H7787 and H7786, that the Chaldee lexicon, it's exactly the same. We've got exactly the same Chaldee lexicon. So it's pertaining, it's pertaining to the same word, a place of rest. A place of rest and the... the Strong's definition in the scripture we're talking about in Genesis 49, it gives us slightly different, slightly different explanation in the Strong's. In the Strong's first Shiloh, a place of rest, we're getting from the same as H7886, which is this Hebrew word for Shiloh that we're talking about in Genesis, and then that word it gives us H7951, which pertains to Tranquil, Shiloh, an epithet of the Messiah, right? So here we go. So this now, for me, is talking directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's speaking about tranquility, and it's giving H7951, and H7951, it's prosper, safety, happy, to be at rest. The, to be at rest, and this reminds me now of Hebrews, the land of rest, the land of Canaan, the land of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prosper, be quiet, be at ease. To have the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in your heart, right? So that's what we're looking at here. So now, 
we come back into the Hebrew word eight seven six two six. That's what we're that's what we're looking at here. So the sceptre shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until peace, tranquility, the Lord Jesus Christ is come. That's what this now is all Ed Murder thinks. I now read Genesis forty nine ten, and this for me now. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Unto the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So this now is talking, for me, absolutely directly now. This is speaking, this is now, I'm being led to think this is absolutely a prophecy to the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 49, 10. And Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And we come into these scriptures now in Psalms. Moreover, he hath called... For a famine upon the land, he break the whole staff of bread. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. The Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we look at the we look at the meanings of the word, and we're getting offshoot, club, scooter, tribe, but we're getting we're getting branch offshoot right we're getting just this connection now with people and plants and trees and the lord jesus christ is the vine and we are the branches right we can do nothing without him we can do nothing without the vine now lord jesus christ is also the bread of life now in psalms 105 we're getting moreover he called for a famine Upon the land, he break the whole staff of bread. So I see this now, and I'm absolutely now getting a connection with the staff of bread being the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's happening when we get famines in the land. The Lord creates a famine in the land. He breaks the whole staff of bread. So... Perhaps that means that there's no, the, the word of God ceases during that famine. That potentially is what these famines are all about. The word of God isn't there. The, the, he, he, he isn't there. He ceases to talk to the people. He ceases to talk to the people. And that's what we're getting in Psalm 105. He called for a famine upon the land and he broke the staff of bread. So the, 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 there's no vine. There's no vine for the branches. He, he ceases to talk to his people for that period of time during the famine. They no longer hear his voice. Now, this also reminds me of a couple of scriptures in Isaiah and Revelation. Now, in Isaiah 11, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, right? Look at this. And, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We, I think we're all settled on that. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And, the, and he's going to come out of the rod and of the stem of Jesse. And he's a branch, right? Branch in the word branch, we've got a capital B. And in Revelation twenty two sixteen, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And as I go on and on in those scriptures, I'm seeing David. David is absolutely a celestial warrior. He's a man of war. He's a celestial warrior. And for me here, this potentially is connecting the root and offspring of David, the branch, the vine, the bread, with also the celestial. I'm absolutely seeing a connection there. So 87626, and just to recap why I'm here, these are the two Hebrew words we're getting for, for tribe. So H7626, this is where we first see it in Genesis 49 and we first see the word tribes. But H4294, this is the Hebrew word that we're reading about in Psalms.
in Psalms, the, the, the rod of the Lord's inheritance will come forth out of Zion, right? The rod, the rod, the branch, the vine, the bread. Surely all this is connected. Surely all this is connected. But in, in H7626, we're getting, again, we're getting, it's pertaining to plants, right? A branch, an offshoot, club, scooped up, tribe. And, and, and it's talking about the tribes of Israel, right? The tribes of Israel. And in H4294, we're getting it as well. Staff, branch, tribe, staff, rod, shaft. Branch of a vine, right? Branch, <laughs> branch of a vine. And we see in the chart of the lexicon a branch, a, a twig, so-called the idea from stretching out, stretching out and... The trees and people, right? Tree, trees, trees and people, trees and people. So H4264 again. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. The rod, the bread, the branch, the vine of the Lord's strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ because it's Psalm 110. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of, of bread, right? So this is what we're dealing with. This is, the, this is the Hebrew word that we're dealing with. Now, as I say, we see it translated out as tribe, rod, staff, stave, tribe. And we first see it in the scriptures in Genesis 38, the adventures of Judah when he went into the harlot. And this is... This is the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So this, this for me, now, I see this and the staff that is in thine hand. This is, this is what Judah gave to the harlot to be for a sign. And this is what he gave her. The staff, the root, the branches, the bread, the vine. I am the root and the offspring of Jesse and and, and 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 David and the bright and morning star and Isaiah 11 and he's the branch right so this is Judah and this is the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ when she was pregnant with the twins that's where we first see it this is where we first see this word right so I'm just seeing all sorts of connections going off as I put down this part of this video right so when we see it translated out as tribe, we first see it in, as I say, Exodus 31, where we're talking about the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Dan. And we see it in, in, in Leviticus, the tribe of Dan. And we see it where we're numbering the tribe. So this is the celestial men that are about to go out to war. So this is, I've been putting down videos about this. I'm pretty well at fever pitch now that this is talking about the celestial H582 men that are also known as angels who are going forth out to war for Israel. And that's where we see it. We see it right through numbers, this word tribe, and it's talking about it's talking about the tribes of the tribes of Israel, right? Now when we see it as rod, we see it in Exodus four for the first time, and the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Now in the world today, they want us to think a lot of things, don't they? They want us to think that Moses is Charlton Hester in the desert and he's got a great big beard and he has a rod, physical rod, in his hand. But the Hebrew word, as I've been putting down, for me, it's pertaining to something completely different. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. So this is where it changes into the serpent. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherever thou shalt do signs. Right? Now, in Exodus 14, I'm thinking this is the rod that Moses held in his hand, to divide the waters when the children of Israel came forth out of the Red Sea. And these most profound scriptures in Exodus 17, where the children of Israel fought with Amalek 
and they had to physically hold Moses' hand. So he held the rod up. He held the rod up because whenever he held the rod up, they prevailed. They prevailed. Now, this is that Hebrew word that we're talking about. In Psalm 110, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. We're not looking. We're not looking at Charlton Heston in the desert, are we? I'm just absolutely way beyond thinking that. It is not funny. Now, where we see it as staff, we we first see it, of course, in in Genesis 38, and when I had and in Leviticus, and when I have broken the staff of your bread. Look at this: ten women shall break your bread in one oven. And they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And then we see it in the scripture in Psalms, and then we come into Isaiah. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor in the day of Midian. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in then hand, is my indignation. So I be I'm just a fever pitch now. We're talking about roots of trees and we're talking about potentially the the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ connection with people. Whenever I get something new and exciting come in like this, it's very, very foggy. It's very, very foggy, but I'm absolutely seeing something here. I'm absolutely saying something here that pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the vine of life, and that pertaining back to roots and trees. There's absolute connections going off here, and that's what we're absolutely talking about in Genesis 38, because this is the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is this this for me is the first story about uh, the actual lineage that goes directly to the Lord Jesus Christ that I see in the scriptures. This is the the, the adventures of Judah in, in Genesis 38. Of course, it goes right back to Adam. We read that in Luke, of course. But this is where it absolutely, for me, it directly goes back to Judah. This is the... Because the, the, every time now I'm reading this word Judah in the scriptures, to me, it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ because he is... He is the root and the offspring of David. And David's Judah, of course. And there's something very, very deep going on here. Something very deep and very, very exciting. Habakkuk 3.14. Thou did strike through with his staves, the head of his villages. We only see it translated out as staves once. The head of his villages, they came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. They're rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou did strike through with his staves, right? With his staves, with his rod, with his bread, with the vines. That's where all this is absolutely leading me to think now. Now, back in these scriptures that pertain to Zion, in Exodus 15, we're reading that the Lord God is going to plant them who... He has purchased, he's going to plant them, right? Plant them, root them in the mountain of his inheritance. I'm being led to think that place is Zion because we're reading that in Psalm 74. This Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt, that Mount Zion is them who he has redeemed, the rod of of his inheritance, the rod, right? The, 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 the staff, the bread, the vine, the, is this the connection to God? The word of life, the bread of life, the rod of the Lord's inheritance. Is Mount Zion, he's redeemed, and them who he has purchased of old. Exodus 15 saying this, are the children of Israel, his congregation, the sheep of his pasture. And in Psalm 110, the Lord is going to send the rod, the rod of his strength, the bread, the vine of his strength, 
and that is going to come out of Zion. And of course, the rod of that strength is, in fact, the bread of life. And he is the vine, and we are the branches. But I look now at verse 3 and 4. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So as I say a little bit earlier, there's nobody in the scriptures who is even remotely compared to the Lord Jesus Christ other than Melchizedek. I want to revise that just slightly because I think David is, because in, in Psalm 22, David talks like he actually is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is scriptures there. I can think of one in Ezekiel 37 where it talks about David as though he is. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 22, the Lord Jesus Christ says that he is the, he is the root and the offspring of David. He is the bright morning star. And David is a celestial warrior. So we're getting, we are getting a comparison there to David, but it's not as, I don't see it as lofty as what we see in Hebrews 7, which pertains to Melchizedek. Now, in John 8, the Lord Jesus Christ is condemning the Jews in the treasury. So much so in verse 44, he tells them that they are children of their father, the devil. That for me must not, must never be understated. Just the sheer weight and magnitude and meaning behind that scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ is telling these Jews in the treasury that they are children of Satan. But the Lord Jesus Christ confirms that they are of Abraham's seed, right? But they are children of the devil. They are children of Satan, potentially the sons of sons of Belial, right? And if you were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So in one word, if I was to ask you in one word, what is Abraham best known for? My answer to that question is, don't you just love that when people ask you a question just so they can tell you what they think? But I do. I ask you, what do you, what do you think? And now that I've asked that, I, 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 for me, it's, it's faith. It's faith. Abraham is best known for his faith. It's not the works of the law because the law was not yet made manifest. Through faith, we establish the law because through faith, the Holy Spirit presents himself to us more and more. Thus, we aren't deceived. And we start to walk in the law more and more every day without even knowing what it is, right? If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the work of Abraham's. But ye are of your father, the devil. So they are their children of Satan. Now, we come down into verse 55 and 59 and these are some scriptures that I see a lot of debate and contention about in the world today just about what those scriptures actually might be pertaining to so the Lord Jesus Christ is telling them that they they don't know his father the almighty but he does and that's who he's speaking of he's come to do the works of his father as they do the works of their father Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Right? So the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here straightly that Abraham rejoiced to see his day. So for me, this scripture absolutely needs to be 
dealt with and it needs to be considered with a considered mind with everything that we're learning, everything that we're learning. And the Jews ask him directly, well, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Well, how can these things possibly be? And the Lord Jesus Christ's response was, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So the Lord Jesus Christ here is telling the Jews, after he's condemned them and called them children of Satan, he's told them that Abraham rejoiced to see his day. So that's leading me to think that Abraham actually knows the Lord Jesus Christ, whether he's met him or I don't know. But the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here that you can't rejoice to see somebody's day unless you see their day, right? So there's something far deeper, far, far deeper going on here. And the Jews ask him the question directly, well, how can, how can these things be? And the Lord Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I read that, and to me, that goes to the Lord Jesus Christ being the eternal being. He has, just like Melchizedek, right, neither, neither start of days nor end of life. He's a continual high priest. He's got eternal life, which then leads me back to the question I was asking a few videos ago, is the sons of God are eternal beings the body of christ the sons of god are eternal beings that are going to have eternal life so does that mean those those of us in the body of christ we actually had a previous life before we got here these are the questions i'm actually seriously pondering here right now so the lord jesus christ answers them in verse 58 Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So that goes to, to me, that goes to the high priest that has neither start of days nor, nor end of life. But Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see his day. Then they, so how can these things be? And they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus, even these scriptures are just so profound for me, but Jesus hid himself. And went out, you see I've got it highlighted, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. There is something far, far deeper going on in these scriptures. But Abraham rejoiced to see his day, right? So how can these things be? Now, I'm also seeing this word rod and the and the stem and the roots as being their lineages, as we see it today on the earth, we see it as lineages. But I'm starting to see, I'm starting to see something far far deeper going on here, because we just happen in Psalm 110 when we read about the rod of the Lord's strength being the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the vine, is going to come forth out of Zion, his sanctuary, the holy hill. We just happen to be getting scripture about Melchizedek. And will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and Abraham rejoiced to see the Lord Jesus Christ's day. And I've just got to keep being brave in those scriptures. But Melchizedek met Abraham in Genesis 14 when he returned from the slaughter. To me, there's an absolute connection. There's a connection going on here. We will continue on without any fear about what man can say unto thee. Now, Psalm 15 asks the question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Is this the tabernacle pitched by man or is this the tabernacle pitched by the Lord? 
and who shall dwell in thine holy hill. So Mount Zion, right? Are we looking at Mount Zion here? And then we bring in Psalm 76. In Salem is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion. So is this question in Psalm 15 asking, who shall abide in Salem, which is where Melchizedek was the king, potentially in Shechem, and who shall dwell in in Zion, and that's where the Lord, that's where the Lord God, has planted them in Exodus 15. He's put them in to His sanctuary, but they've defiled it. They've defiled it, and it's it spewed them out. It spewed them out. Now, Psalms 110 is telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come out of Zion. So. The Lord, Psalm 76 is telling us that the Lord God dwells in Zion and Psalm 110 is telling us that the Lord God is going to send the Lord Jesus Christ out of Zion. So I, I, re I really want to keep going with Zion, but I absolutely, this, well, this is what happens with these videos, right? I've just got, literally right now, I've got so much coming in, so much I want to talk about, but I, I absolutely want to get back to these Hebrew words for sanctuary because it's, it's led me back to Solomon's house, which I've said before, I'm apprehensive to talk about because... It is a difficult subject. It's it's so difficult, Solomon's house, and I've tried to do videos on it before, and every time it doesn't end well for me. But it seems that Solomon, he put the tabernacle of the congregation, he, he had it. In First Kings, he had it. He actually had it, and he took it up to he took it up to Jerusalem. And I really want to finish that. I want to finish off the well, have a look at it a bit more. I don't think anything will ever be finished, but until the Lord Jesus Christ says so. But I absolutely want to, I want to get back to that to that Hebrew word, but I also want to get back to Zion as well. I just wanted to touch on Zion just briefly, just before I move on. I still want to talk about Shechem first as well. So this is what I mean. There's just so much, so much at the moment. I just could branch off into so many different areas. And that's 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 becoming a real challenge now as I do these videos is, where do I go next? Where do I go next? It's, And then you read the scriptures every day and you read new things in the scriptures I want to share. And There's just so much. There's just so much. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So please forgive me if I do sound like I'm all over the place sometimes. I absolutely want to get back to, to 2 Kings 16 and and comparing Carmel and Lebanon and Hezekiah telling us that God dwelleth between the cherubims and the table of nations in Genesis 10. I want to get back to it all. I really, I want to get back to it all. But it's just, I've just, it's been going on a week now. This tabernacle of the congregation, to be fair to say, I am absolutely consumed with it. As I put down this part of this video, I'm up to, in the middle of the Absalom story. So I'm in about 2 second, second Samuel 15 around there. The Absalom story kicked off there this morning. And I've lost track of the tabernacle of the congregation. I don't know where it's gone. It was in, it was in Shiloh. And then when there was a war, there was a war in, it was in Samuel for memory. They took the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh and then the Philistines stole it, and then it came back, and then it dwelt in somebody's house before David took it back to Zion. But there's no mention of the tabernacle, the congregation at all. At all. The word tabernacle only comes up once in 1 Samuel, and that's talking about Eli's sons, the, 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 the priest's sons. It, they're laying at the door of the tabernacle. The women were weeping, I'm being led to think, weeping for Tammuz in in scripture that the companion scriptures from Numbers 25 and Ezekiel 8 where the women were laying, it was all about to move. But the tabernacle of the congregation, I don't know where it is. 
And as I put down this part of this video, I'm in, I'm in 2 Samuel, in the middle of 2 Samuel, and I don't know where it's gone. I've just lost track of it. I don't know where it is. It was in Shiloh, and it was in Shiloh right through Judges, and Shiloh means rest, and I don't know where it's gone. I don't know where it's gone. So, so please forgive me if I am a little bit all over the place, but I've just got, I've got so much coming in right now, and I have been absolutely consumed with this tabernacle of the congregation, and I just feel as though, I feel as though the Holy Spirit wants me here. He wants me here in the tabernacle of the congregation because. I'm just getting coming into scripture now about Melchizedek, which is always exciting. The more I can learn about Melchizedek, the better. And he's come up twice here today. He's come up twice in the last couple of days, and he's he's only in the scriptures three times. So it's it's pretty exciting to have to have Melchizedek come in again. And Shesem, right? Shesem, like is it in Shesem? The burial ground of Abraham, Shesem. Shesem. I always knew there was something about Shesem, mate. Eh? So it seems to me now that Zion, what is Zion? Because in Hebrews 12, 22, 23, we read this. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And in Galatians 4.26, we read, but, but, but Jerusalem, which is above is free, and is the mother of us all. And verse 25 leads me to think that we've got two Jerusalems going on. Because we've got... We've got one Jerusalem who's in bondage and we've got another Jerusalem who is free and Paul calls it an allegory, which I'm being led to think that that, that pertains to a, like a parable, to like a story. And he's liking it, likening it. It's, a, it's like a parable. It's not a literal thing. So, and... and Ishmael, he was born after the will of the flesh because Sarah, the events of Sarah, Sarah encouraged Abraham to go into Agar. So he was, he was born after the will of the flesh, but Isaac was born after the will of the Holy Spirit. He was the child of the promise. He was, he was the barren birth. Isaac was the barren birth, and so he's the spiritual child, and Ishmael is the fleshly child. And that's what we're getting here. We're getting a fleshly Jerusalem, potentially an earthly Jerusalem, and we're getting a spiritual, heavenly Jerusalem. I'm being led to think two Jerusalems. Now, that word and in Hebrews 12 has always stumped me. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So is Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem? Or are we talking about ye are come unto Mount Zion and the city of the living God is a different place? For me... I read this and it's pertaining to the same thing. Mount Zion is the city of the living God. And Mount Zion is actually the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's where I'm at right now. That's what I'm being led to think right now is we've got two Jerusalems. Because we've got the heavenly, the heavenly Jerusalem as opposed to the earthly Jerusalem. So that heavenly Jerusalem... It has a name. There's two Jerusalems. There's the heavenly Jerusalem and there's the earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. It's called Mount Zion. It's called Zion and that heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, that is the city of the living God.
That's what I'm being led to think now. That's where those scriptures are taking me right this minute. But no one knows the date now when the end will be. Not even the angels. No, nor even God's Son. Only the Father knows. The world will be at ease, banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them all away. So shall my coming be. Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind. A man and wife are sleeping there. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we Standing still, I wish we all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind